to him yes sing his praises tell of his deeds to everyone rejoice in the lord let your hearts be grateful sing a song of his love forever Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His presence daily. And remember the wonderful things He has done. The Lord is good and His love. Proclaim His greatness Let the whole world know what He has done Sing unto Him Yes, sing His praises Tell of His deeds to everyone Rejoice in the Lord Let your hearts be grateful Sing a song of His love forevermore. Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His presence daily. And remember the wonderful things He has done.
proclaim his greatness Let the whole world know what he has done Sing unto him, yes sing his praises Tell of his deeds to everyone Rejoice in the Lord, let your hearts be grateful Sing a song of his love forevermore Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence daily And remember the wonderful things he has done And good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. Welcome to Island Bible Church. Uh, for those of you that I've yet to have the privilege to meet, my name is Dan Millay, one of the members here uh, at IBC, and it's a, a pleasure uh, to see you all. Uh, as we get started this morning, uh, I just want to mention one thing. Uh, we'll open with a song momentarily uh, entitled Psalm 100, and it was written by our very own worship leader, Dave Jones. And uh, as I thought about that, I just thought about uh, in First Chronicles 15, uh, we read a verse that says that uh, Kenaniah was put in charge of music because he was skilled at it. And uh, I just thought how special that is that 
God gives unique gifts to people to serve in the church, and we're certainly blessed. I'm sure you agree uh, with the giftedness that uh, he's given our worship leader. So, yeah, so let's uh, go ahead and begin this morning uh, by reading our psalm. We're going to read from Psalm 103, verses 15 to 17. And it says this, As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the winds pass over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children. Let's pray together. Father, we uh, pause now to worship you uh, for the fact that your uh, love for us is everlasting. We're grateful that we can be in this uh, loving relationship with you on account of uh, the work of your son on the cross. Lord, this morning as we worship, as we partake of your word, help us to be ever mindful of that great truth. And uh, we would be remiss, Lord, if we didn't uh, think this morning about the nation of Israel. Uh, Lord, we are grateful that you have uh, brought that nation back together for a special purpose. And we pray now for their protection, uh, for their preservation, uh, give their leadership wisdom to deal with the incredible challenges that they face. Might you continue to preserve them, and may we be a part of a nation uh, that continues to come alongside them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand.
you still waters you restore righteousness to me though i walk through the valley i will fear no evil thing for you are with me you comfort me surely goodness love and mercy will follow wherever i go surely goodness love and mercy will follow wherever i go surely goodness love and mercy will follow wherever i go of the Lord forever I'm gonna dwell in a house of the Lord forever yes I'm gonna dwell in a house of the Lord forever oh I'm gonna dwell in a house of the Lord forever Goodness, love, and mercy will follow wherever I go. Surely, goodness, love, and mercy will follow wherever I go. Surely, goodness, love, and mercy will follow wherever I go. Surely, goodness, love, and mercy will follow wherever I go. Oh Lord, you're my shepherd. You make me lie in fields of green. You lead me by still waters. You restore righteousness to me. Though I walk through the valley, I will fear no evil thing, for you are with me, Lord. You comfort me. Amen. All right, let's take some time to greet one another. Good morning, church. Happy Sunday. Great to see you all. Natalie. <laughs> Go ahead and find your seats. Little ones, you can make your way to the nursery. We're so glad that you're all here. So we have a couple announcements to consider for the weeks ahead. 
First and foremost, we're so blessed to have you here. We prayed for you, and we asked the Lord to move in your hearts this morning as you hear the word preached and sung. And if there is anything heavy on your heart this morning, there is a card in the seat back in front of you. Please put it on there, and you can put it in the offering plate, or you can find me after church, and one of our elders or Pastor Luke can pray with you on the spot. We do believe in the power of prayer, and we've seen God move in mighty ways. So no hesitation there. If you need prayer today, we are here for you. But the two items I want to draw your attention to, we have the women's breakfast. We want to catch up with each other. Isn't that funny? Catch up. Get it. Um, it's on Saturday the 27th. Thank you. But um, Very good. We are working on a location, but it will be at 930. We would love for all of the ladies to participate. We have a short time of devotion, ample time to get to know one another. This is also a great time to bring ladies who don't know the Lord, who can be welcomed into the family of God through something like a breakfast. So go ahead and email me if you can attend. And then on the bottom there, I have Save the Day. So we have the Life Institute coming. They are a wonderful organization that discusses stewardship and how to use the gifts and resources that God has given you to grow the kingdom and to set up the next generation. And so there will be a pastor that's going to come and speak on Sunday the 19th, but then they're going to have specific times where you can meet with a financial advisor and get some help. And so budgeting and finances can be tricky, but also doing them with honor to the Lord is even trickier. And so we have them coming in and we want to bless you by taking part in that. So save the date. If you have any questions, uh, Pastor John will be able to answer them a lot better than I will, but we would love to have everyone participate. And it's not just for IBC. It's also for your family family, your friends, or anyone. And so taking care of your finances in a biblical way to honor the Lord is something that we want to learn about and grow with. So we'd love to have you participate. That's all I have for this morning. If I could have our ushers come forward. Thank you, brother. Good morning, all. Let's pray for the offering. Father God, we just come before you, Lord, and we humbly present this offering to you, Lord. Lord, because you know this is a church that has a heart for the lost, Lord, and you are the good shepherd. Lord, we ask you to bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. And pastures feed us For our use thy folds prepare Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus Thou hast brought us thine we are Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus Thou hast brought us thine we are We are thine, do thou befriend us, be the guardian of our way. Keep thy flock from sin, defend us, seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus. Hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus. Hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Thou hast promised to receive us, poor and sinful though we be. Thou hast mercy to relieve us, grace and cleanse and power to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, 
early let us turn to thee savior like a shepherd lead us savior like a shepherd lead us much we need thy tender care in thy pleasant pastures feed us for our use thy folds prepare blessed jesus blessed jesus thou hast bought us thine we are blessed jesus blessed jesus thou hast bought us thine we are blessed jesus blessed jesus thou hast bought us thine we are blessed jesus blessed jesus Thou hast bought us thine, we are. Good job. Morning. Good to see everyone. Well, welcome. My name is Luke. I'm the preaching pastor here, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to the house of God and to worship with the people of God. We're making our way through the gospel according to John. We've been in this book now for a little over a year. If you're just visiting, uh, we go verse by verse through books of the Bible. We've discovered that that is the best way to receive the full counsel of God. You want to know everything God has to say to you, right? Well, let's just not skip a single verse. That sounds like a good plan to me. How about you? Well, that's the way we do things here at Island Bible Church. And we're now in John chapter 10. And I'm in a two-part message. If you weren't here last Sunday, I, I delivered part one, a two-part message through the opening portion of John 10, the first 21 verses, and I've entitled this two-part message, The Good Shepherd. And if you're not familiar with this really critical chapter, here's what you'll find in the opening portion. A comparison is made by Jesus using an allegory, and he compares the tender-hearted, compassionate way that he leads the people of God to the cold, stone-hearted way that the false shepherds had led the people of God astray. And so the first 21 verses is this comparison, contrasting Jesus as the good shepherd, the only authorized leader of God for his people, to the false leaders. And so let me remind you as we get started about the Bible's use of the imagery of a shepherd. Here's a definition of the spiritual way that the Bible uses this allegory of shepherd. Look on the screen. A spiritual uh, shepherd is a leader who uses influence. That's a key word I'm going to come back to over and over again today. It's a spiritual leader who uses his influence to guide people to God. In short, a shepherd is an influencer. Every shepherd is influencing people to lead them Somewhere. Every shepherd on the face of planet Earth is leading people. Come on, follow me. He's leading them somewhere. Allow me to demonstrate for you the critical importance to our modern world today because if I don't spell it out, it could be easy to go over some people's heads. Um, everyone on planet Earth is following the influence of someone. There are no exceptions to this. Everyone in this room, everyone who's watching online, you are being influenced, but on the other side of that, you are also an influencer. Everyone on planet Earth, even infants, are influencers. I can prove it to you. Go and ask a mom of an infant how much of her day was influenced by her infant. <laughs> You're laughing because you know, oh my goodness, her whole life is influenced by that infant. Everyone is both influenced and also an influencer. And so it's either directly or indirectly that we do this. Moms influence their children. Children influence other children. Just go watch a playground for an hour and you'll see exactly what I mean. TV stars influence people. Presidents influence people. Pastors influence people. Pop stars have an influence on people. And on and on it goes. There's a new category of industry that I want to point your attention to before we get into the text this morning. You may or may not have heard of it. If you're in your mid-30s or under, I guarantee you you've heard of this. 
and it is a major uh, new industry that is taking the United States, at least, by storm. It's called YouTube Influencers. And in case you're thinking this is just a minor thing that only affects a small segment of the global population, you would be very wrong. Let me introduce you to the number one YouTube influencer in the world. His name is Mr. Beast. He's not the Antichrist, I promise you. But his name is Mr. Beast, and more than any other person on the internet, this man has accumulated more followers than you could possibly imagine. As of this month... He has 240 million followers. Now just ask, who, who gains followers? I'm going somewhere with this. He has a net worth of $500 million, all because he influences people on YouTube. And you should ask, how, does the, how do you become worth $500 million as a YouTube influencer? It's very simple. Somewhere along the way, people decided that they enjoyed listening to his voice on certain things. Um, we've watched s several of his videos. They're very entertaining. And I can understand why so many people are following him. Mr. Beast has an average weekly attendance that is more than all of the churches in America combined. What I mean by that is more people see his voice as a desirable influence on their mind. we got to watch the new Mr. Beast. Did you see the new Mr. Beast video? you got to watch that more than coming to hear the Word of God preached. What people have determined is that that voice is more of a weekly necessity than this voice. And it's happening on a global scale. Here's why I start out this message this way. One of the key questions that John 10 invites every single reader since it was written to consider as you read this. John the author is inviting you to ask, which shepherd is influencing my heart and my mind? Whose voice am I listening to? The central point of the passage is that there is only one good shepherd. There is only one voice that is always influencing you towards what is best for you. Only one. And every other voice, if you're listening to it as an influence, is a false shepherd. Jesus doesn't do the politically correct thing. He says it right in the passage. I am the good shepherd. All, other, all, all others are thieves and robbers. What he means by that is there's only one influence that has ever led you to give you God. And he's the one. That's why I've articulated the main lesson, or we call it in our church, the big idea of the whole passage, so you won't be able to say, I didn't know what that guy was talking about. Snap a picture of it. Here it is on the screen. <clears throat> Among sheep shearers and snatchers, words that I took right out of the text, you'll see it this morning, Jesus is the only good shepherd, and there is none other. Before we look at this amazing allegory again, Let's go to God and ask Him to help us tune out every other voice. How many voices have you heard this week? They all want your attention. Let's tell them to be quiet and let's listen to the Good Shepherd. Father, we're going to look at Your Word now. And Your Word is truth. Sanctify us in the truth, Jesus prayed. That's my humble request that You do it in the heart and mind of everyone here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, before we look at verses 7 through 21... Uh, last week, if you weren't here, we looked at verses 1 through 6, the beginning of the allegory. And just as a, just as a quick five-minute review, let's look again at verses 1 through 6 so that we follow the train of thought of the allegory. Will you do that with me? Here's a quick review, John 10, 1 through 6. Jesus speaking says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man's a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow. 
but they'll flee from him, for they don't know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they didn't understand what he was saying to them. So in this first section, last week, I'm going to give you a, a Cliff's Notes version of the sermon. I isolated for you two of five total contrasts that Jesus uses in this opening segment, 21 verses. He gives five contrasts between himself, the good shepherd, and every other false shepherd that has ever tried to lead God's people astray. And we only looked at the first two, and that was the passage that we looked at. So let me remind you of the first two contrasts. Number one, we said last week, the false shepherd is unauthorized. This is verses one through three. They're not authorized by God, even if they tell you they are. They're not authorized by God to lead his people. The true shepherd is authorized. We saw that Jesus was sent to Israel to lead them out. You saw it right there in the text. He leads them out from the false religious system that the Israeli leaders were leading them. Second contrast we saw. The false shepherd is a stranger. You saw that very clearly. They don't listen to strangers' voices. The true shepherd is the opposite of stranger, familiar, like family. When they hear this voice, when they hear Jesus calling to them, something is triggered deep within, and they say, that voice, I know that voice, because God has hardwired those sheep to hear that voice and respond and come out from under the influence of false shepherds. So those are the first two contrasts we saw. One is unauthorized, one is authorized. Uh, One is a stranger, the other is familiar. We're going to look at the next Three, the next three contrasts, and I don't have nearly enough time to go through these because I have a lot to show you, so we need to get started right away. A lot of ground to cover. Contrast number three in our list of five. The false shepherd is life-taking. The true shepherd is life-giving. Look back with me at verses. We're going to look at seven through ten, but let's just look at verse six again. It's necessary here. Start in verse six. This figure of speech, and we said last week, this is an allegory. This allegory, figure of speech, Jesus used with them, but they didn't understand what he was saying to them. So this is really important to understand the flow here. Look at me. The first part of this allegory, Jesus used, and it says they didn't understand. The second part, he switches some of the imagery. It's the second half of a a total allegory, but it's going to change. The first part of the allegory is telling you what he's leading you out from. The second half, he's going to switch gears and tell you what he's leading you into. Okay? It's going to change. So look at what he says. So Jesus again said to them, it's the second half of the allegory, Truly, truly, I say to you, I'm the door of the sheep. So I've just led you out of one sheep pen. And he says, follow me, sheep. And he's leading them through into another sheep pen. Okay? Follow? All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters, so he left one place, entering another, he will be, what church? Say the word. So we know this allegory is talking about salvation. It's right there. If anyone enters by this door, he will be saved. Okay, keep reading. And we'll go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes, look at the contrast here. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But unlike them, Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Okay, for the kids, remember I told you last week about what an allegory is? An allegory is a story told in puzzle form. So you have to take a puzzle and put all the pieces together. And we do that by looking at what the rest of the Bible says the puzzle pieces mean. So that we can see very clearly as we put piece by piece the the image that the storyteller wants you to see. And so last week I started giving you some pieces of the puzzle. I took apart the allegory and I'm going to continue to do that all the way through so that we all leave and say I know exactly what Jesus meant. That's how we're going to continue. Last week I told you two pieces of the puzzle. First, what is the sheepfold? Does anybody remember? They were just attacked yesterday? Say it. Israel. Jesus was sent to that sheepfold, to the people and nation of Israel, to lead them out to follow the only true authorized shepherd. This is an allegory about Israel. Okay? He was sent to that sheepfold. The second piece of the puzzle I showed you was the thieves and robbers. 
Those are the false religious leaders, the unauthorized leaders who were trying to lead God's people but didn't have God's permission to do so. And I showed you that really, 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 really long passage in Ezekiel where God said they think they're shepherds, but I don't know them. I never called them to be shepherds. That's what we looked at last week. Now, we got more pieces of the puzzle to put together. Aren't you excited? Good. The first thing that we need to look at today is where Jesus talks about the door. And this is going to be exciting for some of you. The door. Stated plainly, the door is the shepherd. Let me show you a picture that I showed you last week. And if you weren't here, look closely at this. This is a picture of a true sheep pen, a common use sheep pen that I told you about last week. The common use sheep pen was in the middle of the city and anybody could come there. If you're a shepherd, you can come there, drop off your sheep while you go to the local Wawa. You come back, pick up your sheep and you go home. There was a, a porter who was assigned there, a gatekeeper to guard the door. But I want you to focus on the opening because the opening is what Jesus says he is. And you should go, what, what does he mean? Why does he compare himself to that opening there? Well, this week as I was studying, um, I came across a, a scholar who I'd never read about before. You've probably never heard of him. He's not well known, at least in America. He's got a cool name. His name was Sir George Adam Smith. And he was the professor of Hebrew and Old Testament in Glasgow, Scotland. And apparently, he was pretty renowned, Sir, Sir George Adam Smith. He eventually became the chaplain of King George V and King Edward VIII. Well, his name came up in one of the commentaries that I was reading this week, and I thought, never heard of that guy. Let me go read about him, because he had lots to say about this passage. So I went, and I started digging and reading, and he had an amazing story to tell. Do you want to hear it? Well, he used to vacation in Israel. Whenever his seminary would give him a break, he'd take his family and go to Israel, and he went there many times. And on one of these occasions, he met an actual Jewish shepherd who was there. And in case you don't know, Jews don't talk about Jesus. It's like a curse word to them. So he went up and struck up a conversation with this Israeli shepherd who was not a Christian, knew nothing about the New Testament. That's really critical for you to understand how important it is to know what this man said. So Sir George Adam Smith went and struck up this conversation with this Jewish shepherd, and here's the dialogue that took place. George asked him, so that's where you take the sheep to go in at night? Yes, said the shepherd. And when they're in there, they're perfectly safe, George replied. But there's no door. How are they safe? The shepherd replied, I am the door. Remember, he reiterates here as I was reading, this man knows nothing about the New Testament. He's not saying this to be clever. He's certainly not quoting Jesus. He says, I am the door. The shepherd said this, and he went on like this. George looked at him and said, what do you mean by saying you're the door? The shepherd said, well, when the light is gone, when it's night, and all the sheep are inside, I lie in the open space. And no sheep ever goes out but across my body. And no wolf can ever get in unless he crosses over my body. I'm the door. Friends, this is exactly what Jesus meant. Here are some images that describe what Jesus meant. Take a look. You see the sheep pen here. I know it's small there, but... The shepherd would lie himself in the doorway. There's a closer picture of it here if you look at the next one. He would put himself in that rock space so that if any sheep wanted to go astray, he would have to get over, over my dead body or you're going to leave my sheep pen. And a wolf wants to come in, you come near my sheep and I will slaughter you. Don't you touch my sheep. That's what Jesus meant. If you want to get in, there's only one way in, and Jesus is the way. And later on, he would go and put himself on the cross to know, I will lay down my life for my sheep. Jesus is the door. He leads them out from under the false influence of these shepherds who wanted to use the sheep for their own gain. And he leads them out, follow me, I'm going to lead you into something new. And as he's leading them into this new sheep pen, he's, sheep pen he says, I am the door. And once he leads them in, you're all dying to know what's waiting for them on the inside once they get into the good shepherd sheep pen. Don't you want to know? It's right there in the text. Look at verse 9 and 10. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Look what's waiting for them on the inside. I came 
that they may have, so this is what's on the inside, life. Life. And not just life. This is in the context eternal life. And not just eternal life, but life abundantly. Now before I tell you what that means, let me look quickly at those three motives he says there of all false shepherds. Steal, kill, destroy. Does that remind you of any other influencer? Steal, kill, destroy? Of course. That's why Jesus said a few chapters back, you are of your father, the devil. Talking about these false shepherds. Remember when we looked at that? He's saying the same thing to them. You don't love these sheep. And so steal, kill, and destroy. i got to be honest with you. There's thousands and millions and millions of influencers, and I don't know any who would say, I don't... I'm not here to hurt anybody. I'm not here to steal or kill or destroy anybody. And while they may say that, let me tell you why Jesus says this about the motives of every false shepherd. This is critical. Any influencer, be it a parent, a teacher, a pastor, a principal, anyone, who aims to lead you, come on, follow me. Do you see how many followers Mr. Beast has? Follow me. I'm going to lead you to something good. If they're saying, follow me, and they, the carrot that they dangle in front of you is anything other than God, they are enticing you and leading you to chase after things and spend your life that will never satisfy you. And once you have those things, it will start to bleed your soul dry. Your soul will dry up and so will your life you will feel like a dead person by the time you're in your middle aged, because you've been following the influence of people who've invited you to chase, follow me, I'll lead you to the good life. You follow them there, you found out it was empty, and you feel like, my life is empty. That's what he's talking about. The thief comes to lead God's people to say, come on, follow me, the good life is right over here. And he's saying, you're gonna get there and feel like your life is over. Destroyed. Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it, what? Abundantly. Abundantly. And you say, what is that? First, let me tell you what it isn't. Because this is really critical. Paul, the Apostle Paul, was in possession of the abundant life when he was rotting in a prison cell, surrounded by rats and probably feces. He was in possession of the abundant life on that day. Peter was in possession of the abundant life on the day when they stripped him down to his underwear, hung him upside down, and put him on a cross. He was in possession of the abundant life at that moment. Stephen was in possession of the abundant life when that final stone cracked open his skull and he breathed his last. He had the abundant life in that moment. The abundant life is not what most, not most, many American preachers have led us to believe it is. Jesus tells us exactly what the abundant life is in a spectacular parable. Listen to what he says. First, he tells us what it isn't. Take a look. It's in Luke 12. And he, Jesus, said to them, take care or be on the alert, watch out, and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life, that means the purpose, the meaning, the point of your life, one's life doesn't consist in the abundance of possessions. So he tells us uh, right out what the abundant life is not, Joel Osteen. It is not a life spent accumulating stuff that's turning to dust. How can the abundant life be what Satan offers you to follow him? If you just follow me, I'll give you the whole world. That's not what the abundant life is. And Jesus tells us now what the abundant life is. He told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to, my, to himself, what should I do? Got nowhere to store my crops. He said, I know, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build larger ones. And there I'll store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. God said to him, fool. Please notice the exclamation point can't read that quietly. Fool! This night, your soul is required of you. All the things you've prepared, whose will they be? 
And now here's the point of the parable. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not, please say these three words nice and loud, rich toward God. Those three words are the definition of Jesus for the abundant life. If you want to know what he's leading you out of, get out of that pen where people, false influencers, are promising you things that can't save you and they can't satisfy you. Follow me into this pen and awaiting for you is God. The abundant life is God and more and more and more of God. Not these flimsy things that are fading before your eyes. John Piper coined the phrase in his book, A Godward Life. I I recommend this book to you. Here it is on the screen. It's a devotional book. Uh, You you can read one a day, 365 days. They're kind of short. But the goal of the book, Godward. You ever heard that word before? It's a good word. Think upward, downward, okay? It's a trajectory of the heart and mind. It's a trajectory. I want my whole life to be on a Godward trajectory so that I come into the shepherd's sheep fold and I know that in here I'm offered the abundant life which is God, God, and more of God. It's a continual savoring the shepherd who saved my soul. Can you tell me what else is worth going after for your life? Who cares about the stuff when the Savior offers you the creator of all the stuff? That's what's offered to you in the Good Shepherd's sheep pen. More of God. Jesus is still today, at this very moment, leading his sheep out, out from the false promises made to them by would-be shepherds all over this world. And he offers us a chance to come into the Father's pen. And so, as I explained last week, I want to give you an action step for each of these five contrasts. Like, okay, what am I supposed to do with each of these points? And so for this third contrast, the exhortation is this. Follow the leader who guides you toward the Godward life. Just ask all the influencers that you follow, podcasts you listen to, songs you listen to, people you follow on YouTube, just ask, do they love me? Do they care about anyone but themselves and their pocketbook? Are they leading me to savor the only thing that I can't lose? If so, follow that leader. Or don't follow that leader. Paul was a leader we should follow. And so he invited people saying this. Follow me or imitate me or follow my influence as I follow or follow the influence and imitate Christ. That's the way an under-shepherd of Christ invites you to follow and pursue the Godward life. If you follow the influence of another shepherd who aims for you to want what they sell, simply ask that question, are they trying to get me to follow them because they actually care about me, like the good shepherd, or are they trying to get me to follow them because they care about themselves? Church, I have two more contrasts, and if I don't move on, I'm going to spend the entire Sunday on this one contrast, so we need to move on to contrast number four. Contrast number four, the false shepherd is self Serving. The true shepherd is self-sacrificing. This will be the clearest and most critical contrast of the entire chapter. It's crystal clear. Look at verses 11 through 15. Jesus says, one of the most beloved statements of Jesus ever, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now notice the contrast. He who's a hired hand and not a shepherd who doesn't own the sheep? Well, he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. That's where I got the big idea. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Okay, we got some more puzzle pieces to help us reveal what Jesus is describing for us here. So first, the easiest one of the whole passage, the good shepherd. It is an allegory. And the good good shepherd is, of course, Jesus. And I know some of you probably have portraits of this hanging in your house. My grandfather had a portrait of the good shepherd carrying a sheep or going after the lost sheep. I know most of you know this allegory, but 
Hear it one more time. I want to I open your eyes to something maybe you haven't considered before. If you were here during 2020, not many of you were here during 2020, but if you were, I, I preached uh, an eight-week sermon series through Psalm 23. It was called Soul Shepherd. I spent eight weeks unpacking every line that David said in there so that we would be introduced to Jesus. And I was stunned when I really did a deep dive into this statement, I am the good shepherd. There's one classical Greek scholar named E.V. Rue, and he, he showed me something I hadn't seen before. He showed me that the word good is not like a comparison of good to bad. It's actually the word for beautiful. As a matter of fact, in other parts of the New Testament, you can find this exact same word, kalos, translated as beautiful. And so he translated this verse very differently, and it is a good translation. E.V. Rue, the classical Greek scholar, translated this verse as, I am the shepherd, the shepherd beautiful. And that is a perfectly orthodox translation of what Jesus is saying. Let me tell you why I bothered to tell you that. It's not just clever, it's really important. The reason that Jesus is the good shepherd is because when God looks at all the hearts of all the influencers over his people, there is not one, not one, that's beautiful, except for his. Not one. Let me ask you a couple questions just to illustrate this point. Your mom and dad were the first shepherds assigned to you. And I'm sure that most of you would say, I had good shepherds. Oh, they made some mistakes, but I had pretty good shepherds. Mom and dad were the first shepherds. Did they, even for one day, always, always, always do what was supreme best for your mind, body, soul, and spirit? Always. Come on, think of the day you went for the hot fudge Sunday and got two helpings of it. Always what's best for you. No, not even for one day did you have a shepherd who cared for you for what was best for you. Oh, good, yes. But best? How about you? As the primary steward of your own life to shepherd you. Have you always, oh, I'm going to chuckle, always done what was best for you your entire life? You haven't even made it one 24-hour period. Do you know why? It's because you still have this war going on between the sinful carnal cravings which cause you to crave things which end up making you sabotage yourself. Why did I do that to myself? That's what we do. You haven't had one 24-hour period where you've done what was best for you an entire day. Dave leads us to sing a song, Nobody Loves Me Like You Love Me, Jesus. And I love singing that song because it's true. You have never ever, nor will you ever, have a shepherd who loves you and always wants what's best for you like that shepherd does. And how do you know? Because he, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, was willing to die for you. The sin-stained enemy of God to make you one of his sheep. That's what somebody, that's what a shepherd who loves you actually does. So we know that the good shepherd is Jesus. But he goes on to talk about this hired hand. What's that part of the allegory about? Well, stated simply, the hired hand is somebody who is all about their own self-interest. It's a shepherd who is all about themselves. Um, you could think of it, it's not a perfect analogy, but you could think of it like a mom and dad who want to go out for a date night and they hire a babysitter for the first time to come and watch their little ones. The babysitter hopefully will care for the children. Would you ever dream of comparing the way that the babysitter loves those children to the way that mom loves those children? You wouldn't dream of making that comparison because you know she's just a hired hand for the evening. That's kind of the comparison Jesus is making here. They cannot love my sheep the way that I can because they were brought in and all they really care about is the money that's coming to them. And as soon as you threaten to take their job away, they're out. They don't really care about the sheep, not at least enough to lie down and die for them. The next part is the wolf. In all kinds of places of the New Testament, the wolf is compared to a false teacher, and that's probably what it means here. But it's not just false teachers. It's any kind of a threat. Jesus is there by the door. His sheep, you, are inside the family of God, the fold of God. Any threat that wants to come in there, 
That's a wolf. Could be someone who's come into the church and is causing division. Could be a false teacher. Could be a false pastor or elder. Could be an outside threat like a government. Whatever threat is coming against the people of God, that would be considered a wolf. The contrast here is really the most obvious out of all the five. The good shepherd and the hired hands. And here's what I want to show you. And this is really important. The good shepherd loves the sheep and the hired hands don't love the sheep. Both of them are being motivated by the same motive. The good shepherd and all the hired hands motivated by the same motive. And you know what the motive is? Love. Love. The difference is the object of the love. The hired hand has a deep, passionate love only for himself. Whereas the good shepherd has a deep, passionate love for his father and the sheep that he and his father own together. Love is the driving motive. Look back at verses 14 through 15 before we move on to our last contrast. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Now look at this. I know my own. I'm going somewhere with this. And my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and because of all this intimate knowledge, I'm willing to lay down my life for my sheep. The word know there is the same as all over the New Testament. It's describing, this is so critical, an intimate kind of knowledge that you would expect a husband and wife to consummate on their wedding day. Okay? It's that kind of a knowledge. It is an intimate, one-on-one relational covenant that he has with the Father. In this knowledge is covenantal love. You have to read it to understand it there, but that's what's there. So you could almost replace this and say, I love the Father, the Father loves me, and I'm inviting them to come into the fold where we will all be one, loved one by the other. That's what he's saying there. Knowing is this intimate relationship. If, his, if he loves his Father and he loves his sheep, willing to lay down his life for his sheep, can I just ask you a question? Why would any of us be willing to follow the influence of any other shepherd except for this one? who loved us enough to lay down his life. Jesus to this very day is still wooing. And I love, I choose that word carefully. He's wooing his sheep to him. And do you know the mechanism that he's using to woo his sheep? That. When people know the kinds of sinners that they are and they look and they see this sinless man, the God man, would give up his life and be tortured to death to have me in his sheepfold? That kind of love. Tell me, ladies, this is not in my notes, so I hope this doesn't flop. Ladies, if a man is willing to sacrifice himself to have you, to say, I will give up all my friends, I'll I'll deny everybody else just to have you, is that not wooing? I will dive in front of a truck to have you. It's wooing. We get that from him who woos by giving himself for people who don't deserve it. And that cross woos people. And so the fourth, for this fourth contrast, here's an action step for you. What are you supposed to do with all this knowledge? Well, it's pretty simple. Follow the leader who's willing to love with his life. And I mean his whole life. The call to discern true and false shepherds is all over the New Testament. And the primary mark of a true shepherd is is that they're willing to give all of themselves to those whom they have influence over. Friends, I've been here for nine and a half years. And I've seen that LBI is a very transient community. People are constantly moving in and moving out. And so I'm under no delusion that I will be privileged to have any of you for the rest of my life. Some of you are going to stay, and wonderful. Glad to have you till we both go see Jesus. But many of you will be moved away. God will call you elsewhere. Such is the nature of this island. It's very transient. And so I'm regularly making a part of my ministry to give you some advice about seeking out the next church. So can I give you some advice? If If God does call you somewhere else, or if you're just visiting, look for a church that has elders and shepherds who are willing to give you their lives who are willing to meet with you when you're struggling, to grieve with you when you're hurting, to celebrate joys with you when you're rejoicing. 
Look for shepherds who make themselves available to you. Look for shepherds who want to go have an omelet with you. Look for shepherds who every time they're together with you, they want to just give you more of Jesus. Look for shepherds who will come to the pulpit and give you Bible after Bible because all you want is the voice of the shepherd. The voice of the shepherd. Unfortunately, most Christians, when they move away, they look for the place with the coolest rock band. And the sheep end up starving for most of their life. Look for a place. If you ever move away, look for a shepherd that's willing to give you his entire life. The false shepherd is self-serving. They're hired hands. The true shepherd is self-sacrificing. Which brings us to our final contrast for the passage. Contrast number five. The false shepherd, he divides. The true shepherd, he unifies. I mentioned this last week, but let's look at it closer. Verse 16 through 21. Jesus says, And I have other sheep. Oh, so you came for the Jews, but you have other sheep that are not of this fold. That's me. If you're not Jewish, that's you too. I must bring them also. He's talking about the Great Commission here. Missionaries love this passage. And they will listen to my voice. So there will be, say this with me, one flock, one shepherd. This is the Great Commission. He came for Israel, but he has sheep that are not of that fold. He's going all over the world to bring in those Gentile sheep. Thank God for that. For this reason, the Father loves me because I laid down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. Please stop saying Jesus was murdered. He was not. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I've received from my father. Now look at what happens. As he's talking about unity, look what happens among the false shepherds. There was again a what church? A division. A division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon. He's insane. Why listen to him? Others said, "Uh, these are not the words of one who's oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? That's the end of the allegory. Friends, it's no coincidence and it's not an accident that here John is talking about how Jesus is saying, I'm going to unify the entire world so that there's only one sheep pen that leads to God. And John has in his mind, and these shepherds, false shepherds, who are sitting here listening to him talk about unity, they're divided after he talks about it. That's the contrast that I want to show you here at the end. Now someone probably, if you're a thinking person, is saying, Hang on a second, Pastor Luke. You're saying that true shepherds are marked by the unity that Jesus came to bring, to unify all the sheep under one pen. Well, I got a tricky question for you, Pastor. Why is there so much division in the church? Why are there thousands? There's over 40,000 denominations. Why so much division? Well, the answer is twofold. The answer is because ever since the first disciples were sent out, Satan also went out. And his only goal was to stir up division within the church. He knows, this is War Strategy 101. He knows that if he can divide the church, we have less of an influence over the world. So the first answer to why there's so much division is because Satan is alive and active within the body, the flock of Jesus. But the second reason for that is simply because truth is a sword. And truth divides people. Truth divides Look at just a couple of quick things that the New Testament has to say about people who creep in. Listen to this phrase. They creep in to the shepherd's fold. They're not sheep, but they creep in there. They look like a sheep, and they're causing division and getting people, shh, don't don't tell anybody, but let's get out of here together. And they woo them with all these strange doctrines that sound kind of cool. They're like, ooh, you're saying I can have a fancy abundant life with material stuff and I can have the abundant life with Jesus, I can hunt after both, I'm after you. And so Joel Eastin has the biggest church in America. So follow me here. Look at the warnings scattered throughout the New Testament. Jude 1, the opening verses in Jude. For certain people have crept in. I have to do that when I read this word. Not sure why. I'm going to regret that later, I promise you. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. What kind of people, Jude? 
ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality. Come, get your senses met and deny our only master and Lord. That could also say shepherd, Jesus Christ. Paul adds this. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from, this is interesting, from among your own selves, so they're going to arise out of us, will arise men speaking twisted things to, what's their goal? Draw them away out of the shepherd's flock to draw away the disciples after them. If you were here during our, our series through First and Second Timothy, by the way, of all the sermon series I've preached, First and Second Timothy were my, two of my favorites. If you want to look at them, you can go online. If you were here during that series, I preached a message in First Timothy called Doctrine Matters. Doctrine Matters. And I read to you the opening portion of Paul's letter to Timothy, a real pastor, a real shepherd over one of the biggest churches that's ever existed in Ephesus. And he was a young man. He was 18 when he became a believer and 30 when he became the pastor. Take a look at what Paul wrote in the opening verses. Paul says, As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God which is by faith. But the goal, so time out. He's saying there's people that are going to come in and stir up everybody to argue about things that really in the end don't even matter. And then he contrasts that and says, look at our goal instead. Me and you, Paul and Timothy, we're going to keep our, our hand on the plow. Look at what he says our motive is. The goal of our instruction, true shepherds, is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some men straying from these things, meaning they don't really care about the sheep. They've turned aside to fruitless discussions, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they don't even understand either what they're saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. I love that passage. Here's the point. The Lord's leader, the under-shepherd of the good shepherd, the Lord's leader sets strange doctrine straight. He wants the sheep to stay in the shepherd's fold. So he says, look, sheep, wolves are going to come in. Be on the lookout for them. Don't be led away by false shepherds. That's part of the job of a love. You see that there, right? I remember some, one time I was preaching, somebody came and said, who are you to call out other pastors? And the truth is, I'm nobody. But my command here is to love the sheep well enough to tell you, just watch out. Just watch out. Jesus is still today gathering sheep to unify them. And he unifies them under the banner of truth. And so as he gathers people, they will come together under the banner of truth and they will follow what the Bible says is truth from the shepherd's voice. So the final action step for, for this morning and for the whole series is this. Follow the leader who builds bridges on biblical truth. The Lord came to unify, to tear down the dividing wall between Jews and Gentiles so that there's one people, one God, one shepherd. And how does he do it? How does he unify everybody? It's easy. He levels the playing field. Here, you ready? I'm going to do it. I'm going to level the playing field right now. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Boom! Equal. Doesn't matter if you have Abraham's blood running through your veins or not. Equal. You need a savior. That's the dividing wall. And it's been torn down. And so in our day of rampant, woke ideologies, with all kinds of voices trying to unify, when in actuality all they're doing is dividing us more and more and more, you need to be on the lookout and just simply ask yourself a question. Is this the voice that matches the voice of my good shepherd who came to unify people under the word of God? Or is this influencer who I hear on the news, who I see on YouTube, who I see on my social media channels, do they really have the spirit of God in them? The time has come for the church to be discerning, to determine which leaders are actually leading us to the truth and which are leading us astray. The time is gone when a shepherd, a sheep, or any church can go even a single day without being in their Bibles. Let me review what we've seen so far, and then I'll close this. Among sheep, shearers, and snatchers, Jesus is the only good shepherd. I've shown you five contrasts 
Let me review and then we'll close. The false shepherd is unauthorized. The true shepherd is authorized. The false shepherd is a stranger. The true shepherd is familiar. The false shepherd is life-taking. The true shepherd is life-giving. The false shepherd serves himself. The true shepherd is self-sacrificing. The false shepherd divides. The true shepherd unifies. O oh Lord, you are our shepherd. We say along with David, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Truly, Lord, if you are our shepherd, what's want? We have no want. You have given us all that we need, and if we don't have it, we don't need it. So, Lord, we praise the name of the Good Shepherd who is still today leading His sheep out from under the influence of false leaders, false religious systems that can neither save nor satisfy. And we pray, dear God, that You would help us to be a satisfied group of sheep, waiting eagerly for our shepherd to come and take us home, for we long to see Him face to face. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said... Let's all stand. You have my heart And I am yours forever You are my strength God of grace and power You hold in your hands, still you make time for me. I can't understand. Praise you, God of earth and sky. How beautiful is your unfailing love. Unfailing love. And you never change, God. You remain the Holy One. My unfailing love, unfailing love. You are my rock, the one I hold on to. You are my song, and I sing for you. And everything you hold in your hand. Praise you, God of earth and sky, how beautiful is your unfailing love, unfailing love. And you never change, God, you remain the Holy One, my unfailing love, unfailing love. You have my heart. You have my heart. And I am yours forever You are my strength God of grace and power And everything you hold in your hand Still you make time for me I can't understand Praise you, God of earth and sky, how beautiful is your unfailing love, unfailing love. And you never change, God, you remain the Holy One, my unfailing love, unfailing love. Oh, praise you, God of earth and sky, how beautiful is your unfailing love, unfailing love. And you never change, God, you remain the Holy One, my unfailing love, unfailing love.
thank you everybody for worshiping with us. If you're just visiting LBI, boy, did you pick a good day to come. Beautiful weather outside. Go in the grace and peace of the Good Shepherd, our Lord Jesus Christ. Have a wonderful day.